My name is Tyler Kirkpatrick, and I am the senior pastor here, and I want to welcome you to CK Press. We are a church seeking the renewal of our world, our community, and our own lives by following Jesus. We gather weekly on Sundays for our worship service at 10 a.m., and we would love to worship with you here in person, or you can join us online uh, on Facebook or YouTube for our live stream. Our hope is that this will be a place where you encounter the living God and feel the love of a community of faith. If you're new here or would appreciate some more information about us, you can fill out our Connect card either digitally or on our app uh, or physically when you're here in person. You can download our app, the app, any app store uh, by searching CK Press Church. I would also invite you to check out our website, ckpc.org, where you can learn more about our ministries and who we are as a church. We're so glad you're here. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at CK Press. We're so glad you're here. I'm Amanda Warfield. I'm the youth director here. And we just have a few quick announcements for you before we start our worship service. So the first is in the back of the seat in front of you. There are these blue connect cards. If you're new here, we would love to say hi and connect with you. But for those that are new and those that aren't, we would also love to know how we as a staff can pray for you. So if you want to fill one of those out and put it in the offering plate when we come by later, that would be wonderful. Kids Club is starting February 21st, which is a little, is that next week? Next week? That's this week? Wow. I don't know where February went. This week. It starts this week. If you haven't signed up yet, you can do that, uh, I believe, on the website. So hope to see all of you there. The Promise and Passover class, that starts this week also. You know that now. Um, this is also something you can sign up for on the website. There are, um, there's a class every week through Lent, and then it wraps up with this Seder dinner, the final week of Lent, um, that all of you are invited to join. And then also this week, the deacons are bringing in an expert to share a bit more about memory and brain wellness and dementia. So whether you are caring for someone that may be having problems like that or you yourself just want to know more about it, we invite you to join us. You can either sign up in the Narthex or at the welcome desk or on the website. And then the Easter Cantata Workshop, February 24th, 10 to noon, I believe this is for people who want to be part of the cantata, correct? Yes. Choir. It's for everybody? <laughs> yeah. I should have checked more on that before coming up here. Um, but if you want to join and be part of that, come, come be part of the workshop. And then the women's retreat. You can sign up for this in the Narthex. It's happening March 2nd, and that is happening here, I believe, Diana. Yes? Yes, perfect. It's happening here, and it'll be a great day of just a fellowship for the women. So be sure to go sign up in the Narthex for that. And with that, you can stand and greet your neighbors.
Good morning. Welcome to worship on Sunday morning. Good to see you all here. We'll start with an oldie but a goodie. I'm sure you all know this one. Shelly is going to lead us and sing to the King. this morning comes to us from Colossians. It reads, you used to be far from God. Your thoughts made you his enemies and you did evil things, but his son became a human and died. So God made peace with you and now he lets you stand in his presence as people who are holy and faultless and innocent. But you must stay deeply rooted and firm in your faith. You must not give up the hope you received when you heard the good news.
my friends, fifth grade and younger, could come join me. Hello. Hi, friends. For those that don't know me, I'm Miss Amanda. It's nice to see all of you here today. Can someone tell me what is something kind that someone has done for you? I didn't have um I didn't have the money. Well I did have the money but I wasn't gonna buy anything at the bookstore for my school. And one of my friends got the book I wanted for me. Wow, that is really sweet. Oh, that's super kind. My brother plays with me a lot. Your brother plays with you a lot. That is really kind. Does anyone else have something they want to share? Um, I play with marbles a lot. You play with your marbles a lot? Your dad helps you build really cool marble tracks, doesn't he? Is that kind? Yeah. Today at church, um, my dad let me play Minecraft when um, they were setting up and practicing. You got that, some extra screen time? That's really kind. It's my, since my, I had my birthday party a few days ago, and people gave me presents. That is really kind. All right. Naomi, you're the only one. You want to say something? I like to play with my balls. You like to play with marbles, too. It's kind that Leaf lets you play with his marble sets, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You share with her, too. Wow, I love that you guys have so many stories of kindness. That's really sweet. Um, can I share one of my own? Do you want to hear one? Yeah. So I really love snacks, 
Does anyone else really love snacks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really love snacks, and my husband knows that I really love snacks. And we are not living together right now, and last time I went to visit him, when I got home, he had all of my favorite snacks. And that just made me really, really happy. And it was a really nice way for him to show kindness. So I thought I might do something similar. I have something in my bag. Do we want to see what it is? Yeah. Yeah. I have gummies for all of you. Do you love gummies? Good. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. You guys are so polite. So, okay, what does this have to do with church? What does this have to do with Jesus? Does anyone think they have a guess? We're being kind by sharing things. Yeah, and you know what? Jesus wants us to be kind to each other, right? But he also wants us to go the extra mile with our kindness. What do you think that means? guesses? That's okay. That's a, that's a hard question. It means going even farther, so making a special effort to be kind. And I could stop at just giving you fruit snacks, and that's pretty kind, right? But what if I opened all of these for you right now so you could eat them? That would be extremely kind. <laughs> Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go the extra mile and open all of these for you. We're going to pray, and then out in the narthex, I'll open them for you before you go to Sunday school, okay? Sound good? All right, can you pray with me? (laughs) Sorry, guys. Dear God, thank you so much for teaching us to be kind and for giving us so many great examples of kindness in our life. Please help us to remember not just to be kind to each other, but to go the extra mile when we do. In your name we pray. Amen. We're in the season of Lent. Last, last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. And um, I've been asked to lead us in a contemplative kind of prayer as a congregation and as individuals as we come into Lent. One of the things about Lent is that it connects us, binds us together with Christians all down through history. People have been walking this Lenten journey quite a long time. It also connects us with Christians through these 40 days all over the world today. Lent calls us back to the Jesus path from all the places we've been wandering around. And so, this morning... I would, for our time of prayer, I'd like you to dust off your imaginations. Kind of take your imagination out of your pocket or dig around in your purse for it a little bit. And for the next few minutes, we're going to walk to the cross together through our imaginations. Now, before we begin, I'd like to ask you to close your eyes. This is prayer, after all. And also imagination works better with our eyes closed. And as we enter this time of prayer, to pause. Get comfortable. Breathe a little slower. Recenter your scattered senses upon the presence of God. And let us walk together towards the cross. Lord God, we can imagine the massive collection of humanity responding to your call to walk with you towards the cross. 
We can picture your people coming from all corners of the earth, joining the throngs that have gone before us. And you, you, my friend, do you, do you remember when you first joined this living stream? Where, where were you? How old were you? Who reached out their hand and invited you to come to walk with the Christians? Can you picture them now welcoming you? Maybe you're on the outskirts, still a little nervous to step in with the others. But the power and the draw of the love and the joy of these people is sweeping you along like file shavings to a magnet. And throughout the crowd, we begin to recognize friends and family, even a few well-known Jesus followers. Is, Is that, could that be over there? And they are all so wonderfully alive, so glad we have come. But before we've gone very far along the road, we notice a way station and some people resting in the shade. And just beyond them, a wooden door with the words, getting honest with God, written over the door jamb. Let's rest here, you say. Timidly, you approach the door, a little scared of what you might find on the other side. You wonder if getting honest with God will will hurt very much. But as you slowly crack open the door, what do you see? It's the coziest room you could imagine. On one wall, a crackling fire beckons you inside. And in front of the fire are two comfortable-looking chairs. And in one of them sits Jesus, who stands when he sees you and reaches out his hand, drawing you into the intimacy of his presence. Surprised at the relief that you feel, you begin to lay your soul open before Christ's loving attention. Willingly, you can, your confession pours out how you have been distracted from God. Your selfish preoccupations and lack of integrity and honesty while you were hopelessly trying to impress others. As your toxic words flow out, you begin to notice a a feeling of lightness in your body. I see you seem to move easier, your mind clearer, your heart freed. While at the same time, Christ's hands begin to bleed as he lovingly holds the vestiges of your sin. Although you could sit in that lovely chair forever, you notice the wooden door is open, and through the opening you can see the multitude walking, and you realize these are God's people. These are our people. We are, we are walking together. This is the church. And they are singing. Clearly, the voice of the Lenten journey is not a dour one. Their song is a call to remember who you are and where you come from and where you are going, and and who is with you. The the song's descant, as well as the deep rhythm, you hear the loving promise of mercy and the guarantee of a new life with God. Together, our feet nearly fly to rejoin this stream of life. Our voices become part of this glorious choir Lord Jesus, hear our prayer. This prayer that comes from a deep place inside of us. And thank you for listening closely and lovingly as we say the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be his name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, today we continue our sermon series in Luke's Gospel, uh, but we are shifting our focus to another sort of new mini sermon series within the Gospel of Luke. Uh, We have now heard 24 sermons from the Gospel, coming from 16 different chapters. And now, for this season of Lent leading up to Easter, we slow way down. We'll be wading very slowly through the temptations of Christ in the Gospel of Luke and seeing the ways these temptations uh, of Christ uh, are also our temptations as individuals and as the church. Uh, While Scripture may speak, it's probably worth saying that while Scripture may speak of God testing us, um, it is important to say that God does not tempt us. The book of James actually explicitly says that. Um, A teacher tests her students to evaluate where they are in a subject or to help them see where they are or to confirm knowledge or set a course for future learning. Temptation, on the other hand, is a deliberate leading away from God. A math teacher does not try to lead their students away from mathematics. Temptation, as we will see, comes in many forms, and most often plays upon something good with just subtle distortions. So we begin today with two stories, two foundational stories, two well-known stories. First is the story of two people, but really the story of all people in the beginning. The first chapters of the Bible, God makes Humanity in God's own image, in the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them Adam and Eve. He put them in the garden. They knew who they were because they knew whose they were. They walked with God. God told them to eat their fill of all the garden's trees except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we know this story. Somehow, the serpent got in. The text doesn't tell us how or why this creature bent on humanity's destruction and rebellion against God got in, but there it is saying to Eve, did God really say that you can't eat of any of the trees in the garden? Notice the lie already couched in the question. Well, we can eat eat any of the trees except that tree over there. We can't eat it, and we can't touch it, which God never actually said. If we do, we'll die. No, no, no. You won't die. You'll be like God. And doubt is introduced, and deceit is introduced, and pride is introduced, and blame is introduced, and shame and hiding and fear are introduced. Sin is introduced to the human story. Separation from God is introduced into the human story. The second story is the story of a people, a particular people, Israel, God's chosen covenant people who don't feel particularly chosen or blessed by God where we meet them in the story because they're in slavery in Egypt. We know this story too. God sends plagues on Egypt until Pharaoh relents to let them go, and they pass through the waters of the sea and out into the wilderness. And there in the wilderness they are unmoored. They are out of their routines. And so here they begin to long for Egypt. We were slaves, but at least our bellies were full. God leads them out into the desert to the base of the desert mountain Sinai where he gives them the law. And eventually God leads them to the edge of their homeland. But they fail to trust God. They reject God's plan. And so God sends them back out into the wilderness for 40 years where they wander and wander until finally at long last they return to the edge of the Jordan River. And they pass through its waters finally into their homeland. The narrative that precedes our text this morning in Luke's gospel is the baptism of Jesus, where Jesus finds himself passing through these waters, the waters of that very same Jordan River, and where heaven is then rent open and the Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove, and he hears the words, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And what is the result of this belovedness, this spiritual experience we might say? Jesus walks around in blessed rapture? No. He's sent into the wilderness for 40 days to not eat. Let's pray as we come together to God's word this morning. Jesus, help us to hear your voice this morning. 
we ask that you would rend heaven open, that we might encounter you in the reading of your word and its proclamation. Open our ears and eyes and hearts this morning, this first Sunday of Lent. We pray this by your spirit. Amen. Friends, I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning. We're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Jesus returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and afterward Jesus was starving. The devil said to him, if you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, it's written, people won't live only by bread. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of God in the company of saints. So Jesus was filled by the Holy Spirit and then led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. Why did the Spirit send him into the wilderness? Shouldn't Jesus get right to work, healing people, doing miracles? I mean, after all, he doesn't have very long. One of the things that we are supposed, surely supposed to see here is the way that Jesus is reenacting the story of Adam and Eve and the story of Israel. Uh, to paraphrase one writer, Adam and Eve are tempted in a God-blessed garden and fall, Jesus is tempted in a Satan-haunted wilderness and triumphs. Israel passes through the waters into the desert, into the wilderness for 40 years, and are continually tempted to turn away from their commission and calling as God's people. And they do continually turn away from this calling. Jesus passes through the waters of the Jordan into the desert, into the wilderness for 40 days and remains faithful to his commission. Throughout the Old Testament, the prophets speak about God preserving a faithful remnant of his people. And here we learn it's a remnant of one. Jesus is the faithful remnant. He does what his people were called to do and failed to do, what we are called to do and fail to do. So that's a theological reason and a very important one. But, but why else? Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and there he was tempted for 40 days. Why did the Spirit send Jesus into the wilderness? I'm reading a book right now by a professor named Belden Lane titled The Solace of Fierce Landscapes, Desert and Mountain Spirituality. How's that for a title? Uh, it's partially a biblical and historical investigation of how deserts have factored into Christian spirituality, from Israelites to the prophet Elijah to St. Antony and the Cappadocian Fathers. It's par partially also a personal reflection on a desert of his own life, the decline and death of his own mother from Alzheimer's and lung cancer. We don't talk about seasons full of blessing and joy as deserts, do we? Now, to be sure, there is beauty in deserts. Goodness, if you could only pick one uh, region of the country's national parks to visit, you could do a lot worse than picking the desert parks, Grand Canyon, Zion, Bryce, Canyonlands, Arches. These are beautiful places. But there's also, of course, a harsh and exacting indifference to deserts. So Lane, he, in this book, he writes about a discussion amongst Jewish rabbis in the Talmud. In Exodus chapter 13, after God has delivered the people out of Egypt through the sea, verse 17 says, God didn't lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, even though that was the shorter route. It was actually more direct to go through the land of the Philistines. It's a common translation. Even though that was the shorter route, God didn't lead them that way. Although that was the shorter route, God didn't lead them that way. Well, the Hebrew word there is ki, which can, can mean although, but it more commonly means because. So try translating it this way. God didn't lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines because that was the shorter route. God took them the long way on purpose. And here Ray Lane reflects, if this is the meaning, then God intentionally opted for the more difficult landscape. The God of Mount Sinai is one who thrives on fierce landscapes, seemingly forcing God's people into wild and wretched climates where trust must be absolute. 
God's people are deliberately forced into the desert, taking the harder, more hazardous route as an exacting exercise in radical faith. They are shoved down the difficult path, so there will be no thought of ever turning back. Perhaps others can go through the desert on the simpler route toward home, but the way of God's people is through it. The desert reduces one to a raw bone simplicity. Life out there is lawless. You quickly come to the end of what you have depended upon to give continuity and meaning to your life. There is an unaccountable solace that fierce landscapes offer to the soul. They heal as well as mirror the brokenness we find within. Moving into the desert's emptiness, if the danger is sufficient, you experience a loss of competence, a crisis of knowing that brings you to the end of yourself, to the only true place where God is met. Deserts confront people with their edges. Does that sound like a desert experience in your own life? Maybe one that you're in right now? From dehydration to disorientation caused by an endlessly similar landscape to the scarcity of anything edible to mountain lions lurking in shadow and rattlesnakes beneath the rock, the desert has a lot of ways it can kill you. It's a climate of extreme heat and also extreme cold, often in the same 24-hour cycle. In many ways, this is the invitation to the season of Lent. Perhaps you've never given Lent much thought or attention before. You, you thought it was just something that the Catholics did. In deserts, and I'm not talking about staying at the Hilton Resort in Scottsdale, but being in a desert, vulnerable and unprotected, and I know we have some people in this church who have served in the exacting extremity of places like Afghanistan or the Persian Gulf, and they probably have a better sense of this than most of us do. But in deserts, we come to the end of ourselves. And so this is one way to picture the season of Lent, like you are entering a desert, coming to the limits of your mortality, the limits of your abilities and strengths, the limits of your virtue, where life is scarce, and so you will have to trust wholeheartedly on God to provide. St. Jerome said, the desert loves to strip bare, or perhaps to reveal what is really there. Maybe you don't need a season in the church calendar to do this. You are already in a desert season in your life. You are in deep grief over someone and your life just feels like a wasteland. Everything around you feels colorless. You feel deadened. You are captive to an addiction, but all you see on the horizon, everywhere you look, is just more of the same. No pathways out to forests or rivers of life. You're facing an illness or a betrayal that has stripped you bare of your dignity. Everything you grasp is only sand and rock. You said something. You did something that you deeply regret, but it has set in motion a stripping bare of so much of the life that you knew. You have come to the end of yourself, the end of your ability to navigate a way forward. You are in the desert. This season of Lent where we discover how human we are, just as deserts reveal how human we are, how vulnerable we are. And this, we are told, is where Jesus goes, led by the Holy Spirit. We often think of the Holy Spirit leading us maybe into a new friendship or a new opportunity or perhaps some unseen blessing. But the Holy Spirit evidently may lead us into difficult places, places we do not want to go, places that seem devoid of life. And there, Jesus was tempted by the devil. What did this look like? Uh, Christian art has done a lot of imagining with this. The devil portrayed as this horrifying and twisted creature of nightmares. The devil portrayed as a handsome man or a seductive woman or some angelic being. Uh, Brittany and I watched the film The Last Days in the Desert. One of the joys of being married to a pastor is sometimes movie night is also sermon prep night. (laughs) Spoiler alert on this movie. The first 15 minutes are quite good, and then you can probably turn it off after that. Uh, But in that, the actor who plays Jesus also plays the devil, a sort of shadow self that's both real and mirage. Or maybe we're not supposed to imagine any sort of physical person or manifestation at all, but only those dark suggestions that come suddenly and powerfully to mind that almost seem to come from somewhere else. But one thing is clear. Scripture again and again insists on there being evil that is not just the sum of human oopsies, but is malevolent personal, and very real. 
So Jesus is alone. I'll never forget one of my professors in seminary who had pastored for over 30 years writing on the whiteboard. Never forget this in your ministry. Isolation plus exhaustion equals disaster. And that's not just true for pastors. I think this must be behind so many of the high-profile falls from grace that we see in the public, whether that's a politician, a celebrity, or a pastor. When you reach that rarefied air, it must be so much easier to feel that you are alone. No one knows the burden I'm carrying. I need this. To feel alone and exceptional. I deserve this. Though, of course, you certainly needn't be a celebrity to start thinking that way. Jesus is alone. He literally has the weight of the world on his shoulders. And he's alone. If a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? If a Messiah sins all alone in the desert, does it matter? Will anyone know if he does this little thing? Will anyone know what I am doing in the privacy of my own home or on my vacation? That's my business after all. He's hungry, of course, in a way that surely none of us have experienced hunger before. We must assume that at this point we are well past the mild discomfort of hunger pangs, past hangry, past low blood sugar, past hunger headache, and the susceptibility to irritability and panic. Temptation comes when you are vulnerable. Now, this is because we're more susceptible, but I also believe there is, again, an intentionality to evil, a strategy. An attractive person you easily connect with may come along right when your marriage is in a rough patch. A simple and only slightly dishonest solution may present itself when you are in a dead-end jam at work. A chance to get even or get ahead presents itself in a very simple way. A plan falls through, and you unexpectedly have an evening entirely to yourself with no one around when you are at your most burnt out. The devil begins by saying, if you are God's son, and here doubt is introduced. We hear echoes of Eden. Did God, did God really say that? As Adam and Eve were tempted to doubt God's word, so here is Jesus tempted to doubt God's word, or perhaps just as much to prove God's word. Less than a chapter earlier, God's very voice is heard saying, you are my son, whom I dearly love. Here the devil says, if you are God's son. I'm very grateful to Dave Lester for teaching a class this last fall on the topic of deconstruction. Uh, it's such a popular term right now in and out of the church. And we in the church, I think, need to provide a place where people who have very real doubts can articulate those and explore them without feeling condemned or judged. And I was very grateful for Dave's approach to stay rooted in the creeds of the church. Because I think as much as we need to look at and attend honestly to doubts, we have to be careful about the pendulum swinging too far in the wrong direction. It sometimes seems to me lately in the church we have elevated doubt to a chief Christian virtue, to a higher place sometimes even than belief, with the proliferation of people podcasting, blogging, holding conferences about questioning faith, questioning some of the core beliefs Christians hold, questioning some of the central teachings of Scripture. Now, to be clear, there is courage in looking at, at and wrestling honestly with our doubts. And, and doubts that challenge us to study more deeply, to pray more, to think through what we believe and why we believe it are good things. Doubt can and doubt does have an important place in the life of faith. The church can and the sh church should allow places for those doubts. But we should also be careful about elevating doubt too much, platforming voices of doubters too much as if doubting were courageous and believing is not. I think belief today takes tremendous courage. And honestly, in my life, in my faith, I need more people who believe, who trust, who know and have seen the goodness and power of God. The devil subtly introduces doubt. If you are God's son. The devil is introducing doubt about Christ's identity, about God's word, about your identity. That you need to do more to prove to God that you are worthy of love. To prove that to others. To prove that you are part of God's family. That you have value. We live in a time of tremendous identity confusion. 
people in deep anxiety, people spending years in a sort of joyless wandering trying to figure out who they are, trying to change who they are because they don't know or have forgotten that their primary identity is, you are my child, you are beloved, in you I am well pleased. Everything else is secondary to that. And it doesn't mean other questions about who we are are unimportant. But we lose our way because we make them of primary importance. We can hear the echoes of the tempter. Did God really say that to you? Are you sure you're beloved? Because I see your life right now. I see your career. I see how you are parenting. And those don't seem like someone who God loves or would love. If that is really who you are, then you would be happier right now. In fact, the reason you are unhappy is because you haven't discovered who you are yet. And once you do, then you'll always feel happy all the time. Where are you tempted to doubt God's word right now? If you are God's son, command these stones to become bread. This might seem like a strange temptation. Like, I get the other two temptations in the desert, Grabbing power by worshiping the devil, not good. Testing God by attempting suicide, not good. But this one, I mean, first, this isn't one that we, we will face, right? Even if I wanted to command stones to become bread, like, I could not do it. Second, why would it be such a problem for Jesus to get some food for himself? Goodness, Elijah in the desert woke up to an angel making him cake. Surely there's nothing wrong with a little divine providence for some basic needs. This temptation, perhaps more than the other two, really shows how subtle temptation can be. Russell Moore calls this the temptation of food over fatherhood. It's actually more or less the same temptation that Eve faced. Did God really say that? You won't die. Actually, actually you'll be like God. Moore writes, Satan suggested back in the garden that somehow God was withholding something good from the human. Something that, in fact, would make them like him. Eve started to see God not as her father, but as her rival. That's when she struck out to grab what he was holding back from her. Her appetites, Satan said, were a more reliable guide to what she needed than the word of God. Similarly, when God miraculously delivered manna, supernatural bread from heaven to the Israelites in the desert, some of them tried to hoard it just in case God didn't come through with a fresh supply the next day. Israel came to conclude that God was not a father. They started to theorize that God had brought them into the wilderness to condemn them rather than to save them. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Who among you will give your children a stone when they ask for bread, or give them a snake when they ask for a fish? If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? This is the temptation to not trust those words. Jesus, you are the Messiah. You have so much on your plate. You deserve this. Your heavenly Father is asking so much of you and withholding good things from you. It looks like you need to take control of this situation on your own. I find it fascinating, terrifying, really, that the devil tries to tempt Jesus away from his true identity and towards his appetites. Those, your desires, are what is important. Not only are they what is more more important, but they are who you are. You are what you desire. Your appetites, your desires, and feelings are a more reliable guide to what you want or who you are than God's word is. My goodness, that message is in the air we breathe everywhere, isn't it? Your inmost desires are what's most important, and they are who you are. The advertising industry sends this message again and again and again. We are told that we have to be true to ourselves. Perhaps more than any society on the history of the planet, we are a society of consumption, of trying to satisfy our appetites. And I could rehearse here statistics about American spending habits, especially around Christmas time, or waste, or our eating habits, or or research on the widespread use of pornography and its impacts on relationships and mental health. But we've all heard versions of that before. So today I'll just quote John Updike, who said, America is a vast conspiracy to make you happy. So Jesus' response, of course, is not to say humans don't live by bread. The appetites for food or sex or security are biological and they are God-given. But there are limits to them. 
the temptation to live by bread alone is powerful because I know what I want. And much of the time, I can get what I want. I can Google it. I can order it on Amazon. The temptation to let our identity be rooted in what we desire is powerful. I know I've quoted this before, but you see, again, this message sort of all over the place, a song from the Disney movie Moana. You may hear a voice inside, and if the voice starts to whisper to follow the farthest star, Moana, that voice inside you, is who you are. No, it's not. And this is not to say, again, that our desires and appetites aren't important or that God doesn't place unique desires within us, but I'm sorry, Lin-Manuel Miranda, they are not who you are because our desires and appetites sometimes change and they can very easily mislead us. People do not live by their appetites alone and if God invites us to even set those aside for some length of time or even a lifetime, we ought to attend to that. It may well mean our soul is even more starved and empty than ever. The temptation to doubt God's word then is powerful. Did God really say that you, that you can't do that? God's just saying that because God knows if you eat it, you'll be like God. God is withholding good things from you, things you deserve. Is God really a father who provides what you need? Because look at all these things, these basic simple things that God is failing to provide for you right now. What kind of God calls you beloved and then sends you into a desert with nothing to eat? What kind of father does that? The Croatian theologian Miroslav Volf said, the mother of all temptations is to live and act as if human beings live by bread alone. When we live by bread alone, someone always goes hungry. When we live by bread alone, every bite we take leaves a bitter aftertaste, and the more we eat, the bitterer the taste. When we live by bread alone, we always want more bread and better bread. When we live by bread alone, we remain restless, which contributes to injustice, destruction of the environment, and many other evils. We live also by bread. Without bread, all of us would be dead. Still, without the divine word, we shrivel. The word of God is the bread of life, and it alone gives abundant life. There's also a subtle but powerful temptation here, I think, towards practicality. In our personal lives, we start to focus on the practical alone, bread alone, our job, which makes money, our eating habits, an exercise regimen that helps our bodies feel better, our social life and the people who support us, our hobby and creative outlets and self-care, all good things. But humanity does not live by bread alone. And when our eyes are lifted only to the day in, day out, and not to transcendent things, we shrivel. But if so far we've spoken only of individual temptations, this is also where I find the church tempted. The devil seems to be asking Jesus, what kind of Messiah are you going to be? Faith is nice. I'm sure it helps a lot of people and all that, especially weak people. But if you want to talk about meeting needs, you know what's better? Food, bread. And so too, the church is tempted toward being only practical, becoming a nonprofit, a social service institution, a political advocacy group. And it's not that the church can't or shouldn't have involvement in some of those things. Indeed, we're commanded to care about justice and physical needs of our neighbors. But when we start to live by bread alone, that's where we go. When we see the declining statistics of religious involvement in our world, there's a temptation to make ourselves as a church to prove ourselves to be more relevant in any of these and many other ways. Pastor Dan Baumgartner says, more and more churches and faith are not seen as relevant by the larger society in terms of fixing the problems of the world. And the perception of how to fix our problems is better ideas, more competence, more power or money thrown at those problems. But the truth is, that the problems of the world don't exist because of a lack of competence or power. Most of them exist because we have lost our soul. And surely the state of what is going on in the world reflects this. And so we in the church keep shifting in terms of taking on different causes, always behind the eight ball, always pulled away from what actually does make us relevant, which is a deep love of Jesus that people can experience in you and through you. Our quest to always be practical or relevant obscures the Jesus that can feed people's souls. So, into the desert you go. Maybe that is intentionally engaging the season of Lent, or maybe you're already in a desert in life, a wasteland, a fierce landscape where you have no choice but to trust 
God. Here you meet the end of yourself, the limits of your power, your knowledge, your strength, your virtue. In the harshness of desert extremes, those things will not be enough. The desert loves to strip bare. But before you even get there, you are told, you are my beloved child. In you I am well pleased. That is already the truth about you before you do anything. In the deserts of your life, the temptations will come. You deserve this. Be more practical. Bread is what is important here. You have needs. You're all alone here. No one will see. You're all alone here. No one can understand what you're going through right now. Did God really say? God is withholding something good from you. God is not really your father, your provider. You better store up all this manna, this bread from heaven for yourself. It might not come again. You may not experience such good things again, so hoard them up. Friends, Jesus went alone into the desert. You do not. Jesus faced his tempter alone. You do not. The church does not live by bread alone, and the church does not eat alone. We gather around a common table. We are a part of a community that journeys together, that feasts on bread from heaven together. God may well send us into deserts. God may well use deserts that life unexpectedly flings us into. God will use their extremes to reveal something to you about yourself and about who he is. It might take time. But Jesus went into that desert because there is nowhere you go he will not go. Nowhere you go where he has not already gone. Nowhere you go where he is not with you. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we thank you that we do not journey into the desert alone. That it is not a place you avoided, but went into willingly. The place that strips us bare but the place where we encounter you in new and unexpected and profound ways. We ask that you would journey with us to hear the voice of the tempter, to help us recognize it as that voice, and to recognize especially that we do not face that voice alone, that you are with us, and you give us strength and power, especially in our weakness. Amen. Oh God, you're my God, I seek you Oh, my soul, it longs for you My flesh faints for you in this land this dry land where there is no drink I've looked upon you in this place Beholding your power and glory Lord. Because your love is better than praise you as long as I'm alive and in the face of precious Jesus oh my soul will be satisfied and oh, oh, soul it longs for you my flesh faints for you in this land this dry land where there is 
no drink I've looked upon you in this place Beholding your power and glory elders and deacons available to pray with you in the Witherspoon Chapel, this door up here on the left-hand side of the sanctuary. My friends, receive now the benediction. The psalmist says, I am sure I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace.